Hi, I'm Carl Hurst, Barrister at Number 5 Chambers. Welcome to another in Number 5's vlog style expositions on matters of significant importance in the PI and ClinNeg world. We're here with all of the excitement of the release of a new iPhone to present our thoughts on Ogden 8. You've got uh, three esteemed colleagues of mine as your vloggers today. We've got Gemma Roberts, who has already penned an article on Chambers' website about the impact of, of the COVID economy on PI litigation. Mm -hmm. She's crazy fit, and I think that lockdown, my, my favorite lockdown experience um, is that it's helped me to feel better about myself when I think about Gemma's last run. Gemma, when was your last run? About 45 minutes ago, Carl. About 45 miles? Just a turn, a bit hot today. We also have Richard Moat, who, along with Paul Bleasdale QC, runs the PI group. I tried to Google Richard to find something witty to say, and you wouldn't believe how successful the Richard Moats of this world are. You get all kinds of returns about net worths and impressiveness. But is it true that this Richard Moat was once a cricket scorer and an umpire in the same match? Yes, that is true. That's true. I, 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 I... Multitasking, I think, is what it's called, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> little did we know. Little did we know. And, and finally, and perhaps least, coffers. Uh, John Coughlin, Google told me that you are a Saints fan, but we're not talking religion or rugby. What's that all about? Well, Carl, I was born and bred Southampton. There's only one reason to be a Saints fan. And um, you also found that I played bass guitar for status quo and I'm in charge of children's services in Hampshire. <laughs> Is that right? There's, there's some sort of team in Southampton that's called Saints? That's right, Premier League. <laughs> Impressive. Okay, we're, we're here to celebrate uh, Ogden 8, but can you believe that Ogden 7 was as long ago as 2011? So I've got some, some other questions. That was rhetorical, but I've got some questions for you. This is my pop cars pop quiz. In all of the intervals since Ogden won, we have had the second longest wait between versions. Which versions had the longest wait? Are we buzzing? Buzz. Ogden five to six. Close. One, one to two. Yes, one to two. One to two. There's a man who could be the scorer and the umpire in the same match if ever there was one. Any guesses at how long? 12 years. 11 years. It was 10. <laughs> and what, what is the shortest interval between Ogden releases? Us. Ogden five to six. Three no. years. <laughs> Coppers, we, we were the second longest. I'm <laughs> attention. attention. I think it was at six to seven, I would say. The shortest interval was the interval between Ogden three and four, and it was just two years Ooh. between 1998 and 2000. Okay, so during the currency of which edition of the Ogden tables did Michael Ogden QC pass away? Six. Seven. <laughs> Is it my favourite answer, Carl? Is it five to six? <laughs> it's four. He passed away in 2003, aged 76, and it, it seems to me that it's the only area of his life in which he could be thought to have underperformed because he had a life expectancy of a further 6.56 years on my reckoning of the tables, which were based on the mortality rates in England, Wales, 1990 to 1992. Don't get out much, Carl, do you? <laughs> you wouldn't believe how much I actually enjoy Ogden. Anyway, um, explanatory notes. Here's my question. We know that the explanatory notes in Ogden 8 have, have stretched to about 50 pages, not including the introduction, of course, which is um, an entirely separate field of enjoyment. How long were the explanatory notes for the first edition? So we've currently got 50. How, how long for the first edition? Six pages. Page. Sorry, Gemma. Six pages. Yeah, I agree with Gemma. Six pages. pages. It, it's five. 
we've managed to we've managed to generate another a, a ten, 10 pages of explanatory notes for every one for every one that was originally required so given that these are designed for the the, the dumbest council in front of the dumbest judges does that mean that council is 10 times dumber than we were 20 years ago when this all started so. I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess as to what it, what, what it reflects on my stupidity or otherwise. So Ogden 8 have recalibrated the um, correlation between the mortality projections and reality. Reality seems so much more real than the surreal experience that is our current reality just a few months ago. The most important thing in, in Ogden 8 for me is that we have higher retirement ages um, and it's not so much that we have higher retirement ages but it means that we've got more tables now and uh, excitingly although tables 28 and 27 and 28 which are the fixed term multipliers haven't changed um, they have changed in the sense that they are now tables 35 and 36 and, and that doesn't end because we also have additional tables in the form of spreadsheets that I think, Gemma, you're going to tell us a little bit about later. You can control yourself for that long, Carl. I'll do it. Jeez. But it's not just about the tables. The notes of had a revamp too. The implications are far and wide. Coffers. Does Ogden 8 mean that we're all going to die soon? Or does um. it just feel that way because of the length of the explanatory notes? Well, I'm afraid, Carl, you, um, you're right. Uh, this is probably the headline change underlying the new rules. Uh, it's not the invention of the Ogden Working Party, but the application of ONS data. Ogden 7 was based on 2008 figures. And Carl, if you think back to 2008, the world was a rosier place. Barack Obama was elected leader of the free world. The Large Hadron Collider spun its first proton around in a circle. Uh, but come the end, of 2008, Carl. Can you remember what happened to change the world? Uh, it's um, Brexit. I'm afraid not. No, oh, no. Later. no, that was later. It was in December 2008 that Woolworths announced it would close all of its remaining stores, uh, heralding a decade uh, of misery to follow. Uh, and that, I think, broadly underlies the figures gathered in 2018, published in 2019, that means we're all going to die sooner than we might have hoped. Uh, broadly, that data shows uh, that life expectancy across the board has reduced for one year for men uh, and for around two years for women. And so it follows that the starting point for any Ogden calculation is lower than it was this time last month. Uh, by contrast to the discount rate, that won't have a heavy effect on multipliers, but it will have that gradual or general depressing effect uh, on cases that are going to be settled for a lump sum. Uh, for the first time, the notes point out that this is um, uh, these figures are based on averages. Those averages encompass a wide variety of factors, uh, and it's described uh, in summary at paragraph eight of the notes as reasonable variations resulting from place of residence, lifestyle, educational level, occupation, and general health status. So the usual factors, where you live, whether you smoke, obesity, uh, will not um, uh, give or ground good reason for departure from the tables. The notes now make it clear that it uh, will require clear proof that a claimant uh, life expectancy is atypical before it permits expert evidence to be called. That expert evidence, the notes are clear, should come uh, from a medic rather than a statistician. And where that threshold of an atypical life expectancy is cleared, the notes also make it clear that the court should start with a clean slate. So does this claimant smoke? Where does this claimant live for the standard factors? Whilst turning uh, to the medical factors, perhaps the injuries that give rise to the claim or some other comorbid disease. So there'll be a bespoke calculation in those cases, but uh, the commentary in the notes now uh, will provide a, a good platform for batting off defendant suggestions that there should be life expectancy evidence where it's simply uh, general variations, general population factors. So Woolworths closing has 
increased our mortality rate. But what, what Rich can I can I just be clear on that, Carl? It doesn't expressly say so in the rules, but if you read between the lines, I'm pretty clear that's what they're saying. If if that's what you saw there, I I, I just think that's acceptable. I mean, it, it follows. But Richard, what's the bottom line for multipliers now that we can take into account the Woolworths closure effect? Yes, well, if you take that into account, the difference is most marked when you talk about older claimants, because older claimants, obviously, the effect of the life expectancy leads to a greater percentage reduction in the multiplier. So if you look at the difference of multipliers, a raw multiplier for a life expectancy, for comparing Ogden at seven to Ogden eight, for a man aged 25, the reduction is 1.6%. For a 50 year old man, it's 2.9%. For a 75 year old man, it's 8%. For women, the position is even more uh, changed adversely. Uh, in so far as the multiplier is concerned. 25-year-old, 3% reduction. 50-year-old, 4.4% reduction. 75-year-old, 9% reduction. There isn't the same deductions if you go to considering loss of earnings. The deductions there are very, very mild. But there's clearly a significant deduction, which obviously for an older claimant makes quite a considerable difference to the potential value of any future losses. Okay. So we're not gonna live as long as we thought. It's worse if you're a lass. We all have to work longer, so we get new tables for higher retirement ages. But Gemma, do the new notes say anything encouraging about the reduction factors in terms of employment? Well, there's a lot of changes to the uh, contingencies other than mortality tables, which of course we look at when we're dealing with uh, loss of earnings and pension claims. Uh, so the contingencies are still age, sex, employment status, those haven't changed. <clears throat> Disability status and educational attainment have changed and quite significantly so. So with the disability status, they've reversed, if you like, the disability definition so that we now apply the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act definition rather than the 2010 Equality Act definition, which was I think seen by the authors of the notes at least as being a bit too broad and so what they've done is they've said that you look at the Disability Discrimination Act 95 and the definition notes that accompany that when deciding if, if someone is disabled and what we still have to have then is a long-term condition so a year or more that has a substantial adverse impact upon the ability to do day-to-day -day activities but also that the impairment affects the ability to work, whether it's the type of work or the amount of work that the person can do. I think that's going to have a relatively subtle effect on who is then categorised as disabled or not, uh, but that remains, I suppose, to be seen. And the, the notes really reflect that actually the norm for a disabled person isn't perhaps as severe as particularly defendant insurers would want us to believe. So the norm, if you like, severity for disabled is described as being mild disability or in the mild to moderately disabled uh, category. Uh, and what we have to look at is the effect of the disability on work. So if somebody is only, if you like, modestly disabled, they are still disabled for the purposes of these tables and you still apply uh, the contingency factors in, in the tables A to F. The other big change is to the educational attainment uh, and the notes again reflect that educational attainment has much the most marked effect on your uh, likely income uh, compared to things like geographical variations or uh, the type of occupation that you're in. And what they've done, they've recast the, the types of educational attainment into three broader categories. Uh, one Level one is no educational attainment or up to one GCSE of grade D or lower. So really, um, really quite basic lack of educational attainment 
The second category is having at least one A-level uh, at grade E or one GCSE grade A to C. And then the highest category is now degree or higher or working in an occupation where you might be expected to have a degree, even if you don't. So, for example, at nursing, accountancy, uh, that sort of thing. And so whether we had four categories before, we've now just got those three and they're, they're reduced down. And I think the other point to make here is that the qualification seemingly has to relate to the type of work that, that they did at the time. So having a, a qualification in bricklaying, but actually they've been working as a bookkeeper for 30 years. I think you could probably discount the bricklaying quali the brick qualification as being uh, irrelevant. So those are the, the sort of the headlines. Uh, the, the impairment and the disability uh, distinction is something which gets quite a lot of focus in the, in the notes. And I think what the, the authors are trying to do is to uh, move away from a world where everybody challenges disability and says, well, this is more disabled, this is less disabled, uh, we therefore need to have a bespoke, uh, bespoke multiplier. Uh, my view reading the, the notes is that there's an emphasis on saying that these tables are based on a broad spectrum of disabilities and therefore they are going to be more applicable. Very difficult because the, the way it seems to work is that the notes say that the amount of people who register or are considered to be disabled has gone up from 12% to 19%. And essentially what the tables are trying to say is that a number of people as a result of the definition under the Equality Act have been sucked into being considered disabled, which has caused considerable difficulties for the court in assessing how any future loss of earnings claim should be considered. And they put forward in the Ogden Table 8 that in fact billet was decided on the basis there was a disability, whereas in reality they think that there shouldn't have been a disability there, just simply a claim for disadvantage in the open labour market. And what the tables are keen to enforce is that if somebody is sufficiently seriously affected to be disabled, then the tables should very definitely be the starting point and they shouldn't be altered by the whim of judges such as by say splitting the difference between a disabled and a non-disabled rate if there are to be changes it should be done by firm and clear evidence and that's what the tables new tables are emphasizing and putting forward yeah and i think that makes sense because if you think about the purpose quite often of the, the disability discrimination act or the equality act that's to provide protection for people who are disabled in employment, so they need adjustments and that sort of thing, so that almost they can continue to work at the same level as they would have been able to do even if they weren't disabled. So then to use that definition to say, well, these people are going to earn less because they're disabled, it's, 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 not, the same, um, it's not the same thing. It's apples and pears, to my mind, which I think is why where the authors of these notes have, have drawn back and, as Richard said, it's if you meet these categories, uh, and definitions then you're disabled. Um, the substantial adverse impact on day-to-day -day activities doesn't necessarily affect the ability to work, which is why you have to tie it in with the ability and, and, and to function in the workplace. Now I'm going to stop the two of you there because um, you are in danger of distracting me from my primary excitement about the fact we now have more tables. Um, before we, before uh, coffers before I bring you in again, um, could Richard, do you, do you have a headline for us on the new PPO section that there is in the tables? Just don't, don't do anything that's going to compete with my excitement here for, for the expansion of the number of tables. No, again, it sets out in considerable detail and very carefully the uh, views that you should consider with respect to periodical payments orders and certainly refer to... Uh, uh, part D, part E, I should say, with respect to the Ogden tables, in terms of considering what they have to say. Oh, um, you know, you're disciplined in your excitement there. Love it. Thank you. Coffers, um, all the cool kids are talking about the new pension loss notes. What can you tell us about that? Well, I was listening to a piece on Radio One just this morning about the pension loss provisions of Ogden 8, Carl, and um, it was cracking. Listen, listen back on iPlayer. And as you know, there have been pension tables in Ogden since the first edition, when there were only six tables in total, and as you say, five pages of guidance, but never 
uh, any proper explanatory notes. Uh, only a couple of worked examples. Practitioners were generally left to get on as best they could. Uh, but perhaps unsurprisingly, since we're now in the era of auto-enrolment and compulsory contributions, we now have a shiny new section C. And it's drawn in um, fairly straightforward, basic terms. Indeed, paragraph 120 lists the leading case law and directs practitioners as to how a pension loss is properly prepared. It's a bit of a nolly guide, but it's a good starting point. Uh, and there is gentle encouragement in these notes towards taking the simplistic approach that taken by the court in Manor and Central Manchester University hospitals, uh, where uh, the claimant claimed and the judge allowed uh, just the lost contributions from the employer during the period of expected employment. Um, there is also, though, a worked example of a local government scheme, a 149th type scheme. Uh, and if the facts of your case uh, can be done simplistically or that there is a, a defined prescribed scheme, then use the tables. But hallelujah for the first time, if it does look more complicated than that, there is now positive support in the notes, paragraph 121, for expert evidence to be adduced, the forensic accountant actuary evidence. So Carl, get ready to roll that one out at your next CCMC and I think we can properly leave pensions there. I think you're just showing off. There you go, just throwing authorities out into the conversation and talking about having read as far in the tint of the notes as 120 paragraphs. You. But Richard, I know I can count on you to have read further section D of the notes, even deeper into the notes than section C, refer to fatal accidents. They've been rewritten and updated. Yes, they have, uh, because the law has changed. Uh, when the previous uh, edition of Ogden uh, was written, Cookson was the law which said that fatal accident damages should be calculated from date of death. Now, following the decision of NOW and Ministry of Justice, it's from the date of trial. And so uh, the notes have been rewritten to cover that and also to set out, again, a large number of examples and very helpful uh, guidance, which is written in very simple form. So I'm sure you'd be able to follow it, Carl, to be able to consider all fatal accident claims. Uh, very, very helpful, very, very useful to read. Uh, and uh, I'd uh, encourage everybody to have a look at them. Okay, enough. Start with the authorities and the paragraphs and the insults. Um, and back to the real world. Gemma, bail me out here. What do I need to know right now and what should I be doing? Well, Carl, what you should be doing is going online and looking at the, uh, the government's website because they've actually given you the Excel spreadsheets from which this data derives. And you can play uh -huh. for yourself with the data on the spreadsheets. And you can, we won't go into it now because we simply don't have time and you'll get too excited, but you can use the Excel spreadsheets to very easy, easily interpolate between the various different figures. We've got more tables. More tables! <laughs> more tables makes the, uh, the, the, the great fun process of interpolating all the different data uh, more easy. Uh, it should be less uh, time consuming, so you'll have more time to read the notes again and again, Carl. And what you also need to be doing, I think, is looking through your paperless files of cases that you have sitting on your virtual shelf and checking your very, very well-pitched Part 36 office just to make sure that they fall the right side of the line because with the adjustments that we've been talking about, the life expectancy to uh, disability definition and educational attainment, there might be a couple of cases which you want to think about withdrawing that Part 36 or indeed accepting a Part 36 um, because the values of some cases, particularly those involving older claimants, are likely to have been adjusted a little bit. But of course, a little bit makes all the difference in the world with, um, with some Part 36s. And Carl, you can start to get excited because we think in about four to five years' time, there's going to be Ogden 9. The, the notes refer to a review in four to five years' time. Uh, so who knows what will have become of COVID and all the rest of it by that point but I think there might be some very subtle changes to life expectancy, but maybe more changes to things like uh, the, the, the worker uh, loss of earnings uh, tables and that sort of thing to account for the fact that the where we'll work might have changed. We'll be working from home 
if we're lucky enough to still be working, if the economy continues to slide. Uh, and let's see, see where we go from there. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's close there and head off to sit in the sun and make our own interpolated tables um, until the clerks call us together, put something in the diary of four or five years for the next version of the tables. Many thanks to our luminaries, Gemma Roberts, Richard Moat, and John Coughlin. Thank you, Carl. Thanks, Carl. <laughs>